Hello, everyone. My name is Gerard Silvestri. I'm here with Adam Fox, an assistant professor of medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina, where I've actually practiced for 30 years come tomorrow. Um, today, we're here to talk to you about enhancing non-small cell lung cancer biomarker testing. And what we've done is put together a really practical clinical checklist. What we'd like to do is take you through that checklist, tell you really how important it is to think about biomarker testing as a pulmonologist for uh, those with actually local lung disease and all the way up through metastatic disease where it's imperative to sort of figure that out before your patients get treated um, because we want to treat with the right drug the first time. We also want treatment to occur quickly, as quickly as you can. Through the work that um, Dr. Fox has done and, and, and our lab has done, we've kind of figured out that, man, even in a place like a university hospital, sometimes that, uh, that test that we're in can get disjointed. Patients wait a long time to get their biomarker testing. And so what we want to do is uh, take you through what we think is are the important aspects of getting biomarker testing in a timely fashion. Um, yes, that's us. You've seen us already. Um, these are our disclosures. Most of those are for research studies that we have in biomarkers. Um, and, and so I'm going to turn it over for Adam to Adam for a second. I actually think this first line really encompasses everything. If I can make a tagline for biomarker testing, I would use this uh, tagline. So Adam, please take it away. So uh, our goal for lung cancer, for precision medicine for lung cancer, is to coordinate systematic, comprehensive, and timely testing to assess all eligible patients to really deploy a biomarker-informed treatment plan. And so even if they don't have a biomarker that's positive, it's still informed by what biomarkers their cancer has. And so to, to take you through this kind of common diagnostic pathway that patients go through, this is everyone comes in with different symptoms and, and imaging, but this is sort of a common pathway. At the, at the left side of the screen, advanced lung cancer is suspected or any lung cancer suspected. So, some sort of biopsy is performed, uh, cancer is confirmed, uh, biomarker testing then has to be ordered. So somewhere along this time frame, someone on the team has to order biomarker testing. And then those results have to be available, ideally before any treatment is, is delivered. And so this time frame can take, uh, you know, weeks and weeks to complete and how how does each patient complete this pathway within the shortest amount of time with the best amount of information uh, and of course staging happens across uh, this entire timeline from the very first image that's taken to which biopsies uh, chosen but all of those components together really inform the treatment you know, and I feel like, Adam, that, you know, what we've noticed in, in our institution, but also in some surveys we've done nationally is all of all just kind of feel like their work is done after the biopsy is performed and they refer the patient out for treatment. Unfortunately, if you wait until the patient's referred, for example, to an oncologist, they may wait two weeks for that appointment. And then if biomarker testing is not done, uh, then it could be another 10 days to two weeks before they have that testing available. And all that time uh, leads to tremendous patient anxiety. Um, and more importantly, it can lead them to start treatments that they, they shouldn't get uh, before they have their uh, testing done and back. So um, this is our what we call uh, a biomarker checklist. That checklist is available through CHEST, and, um, and so it'll be highlighted. And we want to take you through this checklist now uh, and talk you through some of the important points. So take it away again, Adam. So uh, this this first series of slides is really going to focus on institutional coordination of a biomarker testing program, uh, and then we'll go through a case by case kind of checklist uh, after this one. Uh, so obviously, this is going to take time to establish. Not all of these check boxes can be done in one day or a single meeting, and of course, we're going to have to collaborate with all of our different uh, subspecialists. So the first, the first uh, checkbox on this list is really to identify all the relevant stakeholders for, for precision medicine uh, at your local institution, uh, considering staff uh, where procedures uh, take place, clinic staff, and, and anyone who procures uh, biopsy samples, of course. I mean, there's a couple on there that really jump out. Everyone thinks it's about the medical oncologist who a lot of times orders these tests, but the two that jump out to me are pathologists. You need to bring the pathologist in early for several reasons. One is to figure out if they send their pathology out, if they keep it in. 
Um, how do they want the specimen prepared to get the maximum use out of that specimen? And the other is interventional radiology. Um, you know, I know we believe and we should believe that we do most of the biopsies through EBIS, for example, for advanced lung cancer, but many biopsies in many institutions are done uh, through a transthoracic needle aspiration approach. And if they're not in the loop, uh, again, those patients can't get tested in a timely manner. So those are the two that sort of jump out to me. Of course, nurse navigator for your cancer clinic would be really, really important. Uh, and before making any kind of changes, you have to know what the current state is your institution. So we'd ask people to sit down and describe how does biomarker testing currently work? And then a big question, define patients that you and your uh, local community believe are eligible uh, for, for biomarker testing. This is different than 2010 to 2015 to today, and it, it's still going to change over time. So this checklist leaves us just a little bit vague because you have to look at the most up-to-date uh, information and guidelines as to who should be eligible for biomarker testing and for what but everyone should get together to ensure that everyone knows what kind of local practice uh, should be. So, so Adam, five years ago, it was we only test for advanced metastatic lung cancer. Then it moved back to, oh, well, you know, maybe 3A, 3B we should be testing for. And now we're looking at doing biomarker testing from 1B, stage 1B, all the way through uh, to stage four and, and looking at those patients to see if they, de they develop uh, cancer that requires adjuvant uh, biomarker-directed therapy after surgery, for example, those that are EGFR positive, to neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy followed by surgery. You can't know what to deliver to those patients without doing the biomarker testing. So, And that might change. Next week, something can come out and say, hey, look, these patients, there's a new drug with a new target. They have to be tested for this in this stage with this type of cancer. And so these, these next two slides put some of those considerations for advanced stage. You know, everyone should get a PDL one immunotherapy test. And then there's there's uh, this recommendation in the guidelines for testing all patients that non-squamous, considering for squamous. That's because uh, actual mutations do occur in squamous histology. It's just at a lower rate than the non-squamous histology. And uh, with with newer biomarkers uh, like KRAS G twelve C, maybe this will change in the future. But for now. Really, that's why we say we should all get together uh, and decide locally what our practice should be for standard of care for our patients. Uh, and drug, like you were mentioning, for early stage considerations, uh, at least EGFR, ALK, and PDL one for those who may be eligible for adjuvant or new adjuvant therapies to direct their use. Uh, so we would say uh, to prioritize tissue-based comprehensive biomarker testing in the advanced and metastatic stages. And so by comprehensive, we mean testing for all of the potential therapies for which they may be eligible. So that means more than just one or two biomarkers. And uh, it, in selection of this, this test or this series of tests you're going to do, you have to really see what's there on the ground locally. Do you have the capacity to do testing in-house? If so, how comprehensive is that testing? How, how good is it? And uh, what's already being done at, uh, to one or more commercial laboratories. So uh, this is something in terms of turnaround time, costs, and capabilities that one has to uh, kind of assess locally. And, and Adam, at our place, like, you know, what was so interesting is once we start digging into this, just, you know, you would think we would know this. Adam and I um, see five to seven new lung cancers a week. We, we live, eat, and breathe this stuff. And yet, when we start digging into it, it was like, well, wait a second, sometimes it gets sent out, sometimes it doesn't. Why? No one really had a good reason for us. And so um, just mapping out what your institution does um, to, to do this biomarker testing is really, really important um, uh, so that you can know once you send your specimen down from EBIS or, or uh, other types of bronchoscopy, you know what's going to happen at that time and what you're going to order, et cetera, et cetera, or what your team's going to order. And then, of course, there is an established role for serum-based biomarker testing, uh, but this is this is in flux just over the last couple of years. Certainly, for someone who can't get a repeat biopsy uh, or is too high risk or or has already failed for some other reason, it, it certainly uh, uh, should be strongly considered. But there's all sorts of uh, timing and, and patients in which uh, people are kind of investigating when to use this serum uh, serum-based testing. So. Again, we should be prioritizing the gold standard, which is testing on tissue. And uh, and I think this is going to be a space that continues to evolve even just over a couple of short years. 
Yeah, I think it's really important. Uh, I can't say this enough about tissue. You want to get as much as you possibly get. Um, at our institution, we're taking five or six extra EBIS uh, passes after our non-site cytopathology says, yes, you have cancer, just to make sure we have enough for next generation sequence testing. And so we are all about tissue conservation, making sure that you maximize the tissue that you have. And then, of course, if that fails to produce enough DNA uh, to, to do uh, next generation sequencing, or if the patient has recurrent disease, we may try uh, serum-based testing, which again is, a, is in evolution. Right now, we would argue that the standard of care is tissue-based testing. Uh, just a, a quick side note there uh, to keep in mind, serum-based testing can't assess for pdl one status, and uh, a negative result can't really be trust, uh, trusted if you really have a high suspicion this patient should have an actual mutation. Uh, this, this would not be adequate if it was named. Um, the next things uh, on this checklist are really uh, about uh, making sure everyone knows uh, what you need. So we've kind of already described knowing what assay and everything, but everyone needs to know what that assay is and what the approximate tissue requirements are and what to do with it. Yeah, and pathology is a really good partner here, right? And and so I often joke around that, you know, go buy a cup of coffee and go to the bowels of the hospital because that's where pathologists usually hang out. They're very happy to see other humans um, and and sit down with them and say, hey, how much tissue do you need? What what kind of, what do you like it in? Do you like it in Cytolite? Do you like it in Hank solution? How many passes do you think is good? Should we look and see how many times we've had this really new buzzword in precision medicine, quantity not sufficient, QNS? Um, and we, we keep track of that at our institution because we want to make sure we're giving them adequate uh, specimens. What The last thing you want is to have to have a patient go through a second procedure, which is really, uh, you know, it's, it's hard enough that they're going through this early, hey, I might have cancer, but then to put them through a second procedure, it's just heartbreaking. So you, you also want to establish a, a clear responsibility for who and how ordering a biomarker testing is going to happen. Uh, this was a, a topic central to our, our third webinar, of which this is number four. And um, really talking with your with your team, what team do you have? What expertise do you have? And uh, who's going to order this biomarker testing uh, throughout your institution from any any number of directions? Right, and 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 again, um, we are agnostic to basically who is doing the ordering. What we're saying is you need to have a process for that. So whether it be at the site of the biopsy, so for us in our bronchoscopy lab now, if we know we have an advanced or metastatic patient and on-site site pathology says, yes, Gerard, you have cancer, we get those extra passes. The order goes in immediately that we want pdl one and next generation sequencing performed uh, on that specimen. And so uh, that's sort of reflex testing, right? And we're going to get to reflex testing. Uh, we think that that's the way to go, that if the pathologist has an order, when a tumor type and a certain stage comes in, they can automatically send it out to to be tested immediately or run it in-house so that there's no delay between the time of biopsies performed and the tissues getting uh, processed and then sent for testing. Uh, and if you're, if you're setting this up newly in your institution, uh, or if you already had experience, you know that these test results get hidden in all sorts of places in the chart. And so we think that really making sure that you have a plan for where these tests can go to, to where they're ready to all the team members uh, is really important uh, in planning for, for really setting up your institution's biomarker program. You know, here I, I would say, Adam, that, you know, with our, with our specialty, take us out of the cancer realm for a second. There's nothing worse than seeing a new patient with shortness of breath um, and not having a radiograph or pulmonary function studies, right? Like that's our, um, those are our two things that we know we want to have. And so oftentimes when we're seeing a new patient, we instruct our administrative staff, hey, get breathing tests, get a CT or a chest x-ray for this patient or gather that from another institution. What would be the worst thing is a new patient goes to visit their medical oncologist two weeks after they've had their biopsy only to find out that their medical oncologist can't give them treatment re recommendations and shouldn't give them treatment recommendations because they don't have their biomarker testing results. And so having those results in a place where the oncologist has access, but also has them back by the time the patient gets to see them is really important. 
Uh, the last is the last couple bullet points here are all about uh, measuring this process and and uh, collaborating to improve it and streamline it. So first, you have to measure something uh, in 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 this spectrum to know how well you're doing. So uh, like Gerard said, we're looking at turnaround intervals. There's a lot of turnaround intervals. We'll look at some of those in the case, but trying to measure some turnaround time intervals, how often you're having different specimens from different sites be not sufficient for testing. Uh, and even are you testing everyone who you think should be testing? So this can be pretty tough to measure, but picking out several of these that are, are measurable within your electronic medical record or institution can really help uh, fuel process. Yeah, and here, Adam, I'd say, I think when we started looking at our own data, um, we are pretty stunned, right? Like I was stunned at, and we thought we were doing a, a really good job with this, and we'd find patients that weren't tested at all, We'd find patients where, you know, even with the best intention, intentions, it was taking, you know, three weeks or more to get that data back. And, you know, we found places that were just incredible. Like, so if this one person was on vacation, like everything ground to a halt and there was no backup for that person. And so we didn't even know that uh, uh, until we really started looking into it. So keeping some kind of data around your turnaround time, are you testing all the people who require testing, how many specimens are quantity not sufficient so that you had to go back and biopsy them or send it for uh, a liquid biopsy would be really important. And so I, I urge you to think about what happens in your own institution. Um, you know, these are these are the kind of quality improvement. I know some people, um, physicians are so busy, they don't you know, sort of like to get into quality improvement. But man, this is one of those projects that if you get involved in it, you can be such, doing such a great job for your patients um, out the back end. Uh, so the next talk part is just actualizing these results. You have to have a plan to sit down, look at what you've measured, uh, get feedback from different people about what barriers uh, are being experienced, uh, and and try to improve this process because that, you know all patients are going through this in a different in a different way with different barriers. Uh, but really the goal should really be to have this done systematically for all eligible patients to make sure everyone gets uh, a clear and equal plan forward. And, you know, I dare say this can actually be fun. I mean, I know that sounds horrible, but, um, you know, if you can put together an operations team and don't, you know, don't hesitate to get an administrative person from one of those specialties like pathology, for example, get a few of your doctor friends involved, get an oncologist involved, get a pathologist involved, a pulmonologist at the very least, maybe someone from IR, um, and, and sit down after you've gathered some of this information. You're going to need help outside the medical field. So admit a really strong administrative assistant who's dealt with this kind of thing before can be invaluable. So once that operations team gets together, um, it won't take long from there to come up with a really good process that you can present to the rest of the physician's care to these patient types. And then you have to establish a, a way to keep track of changes over time, uh, both at your own institution, but also in, in biomarkers, uh, therapies, indications for their use. Uh, we just kind of talked briefly about how this has changed in the last 10 years. Uh, and it's going to continue to change, and and the way the way we all practice to coordinate this is going to continue to have uh, changes over time. So we have to be able to communicate that across this entire team to care for patients. Yeah, and here I would say, look, in the in the first fifteen or twenty years of my career, there were two drugs, right? Like it was platinum based chemotherapy, it was cisplatinum or carboplatinum with one of a myriad of other drugs. Now, like. Every week, there are new FDA-approved drugs, and some of them require the same targets, like EGFR, um, but some of them are going to require looking for a new target, like um, KRAS G12C, for example. So you're not going to be able to keep up with that. I don't think pulmonologists should have to keep up with that. This might be one that's assigned to a medical oncologist, hopefully with a real interest in lung cancer, with a pathologist who understands what's going on. But there are FDA approved drugs. And listen, if you're the patient, if that patient's your family member, you want them to get one of these targeted agents because sometimes they're oral medications that can increase five-year survivorship by logarithmically. So whereas we have almost no one surviving with stage four disease, if you can get one of these targets, it's not uncommon to, to live out 
three to five years um, uh, past your diagnosis. So really important to learn what's coming down the pipe. Doesn't have to be you, but there has to be a plan to capture the new FDA improved target, approved targets with drugs to target those mutations. So I want to all pivot here uh, to the case by case uh, checklist, or really focusing on individual patients and how to do this for an individual patient. And so this 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 goal is very similar to the institutional goal, but brought down to the single patient le level. We need to get the best image and biopsy procedures to provide all the information we need: diagnosis, staging, and biomarker testing to really deploy. Uh, that therapeutic plan that's informed by that biomarker data. So first, this is a, this is just a blanket statement across the entire process. Anytime where there's uncertainty over diagnosis, what procedure is best? Is there a role for biomarker testing? What stage is the patient? You know, having the multidisciplinary team, uh, like a two or more discussion or other kind of collaboration, is always going to be best to get those questions answered where there's any uncertainty. Uh, the rest of the checklist is going to be this kind of before and after kind of diagnosis scheme. Uh, so you can see uh, for the before diagnosis, you want to make sure the patient knows that biomarker testing and some of these precision medicine therapies might be relevant to them, especially when there's a very high suspicion for non small cell lung cancer, because that testing, as we've already talked about, takes time. And any time the patient's waiting for any of this information that we need to put together a treatment plan, they're usually anxious about it and they want to know uh, what the holdup is. And so, you know, I think letting them know up front, there's going to be an extra wait before we can put your plan together for this one test that is so critical uh, can really help with with some of that anxiety they may experience. Yeah, so I'm, I think I've said this so many times, but it's, it, it bears repeating. Um, if you look at psychologic studies, you would think that for a patient with lung cancer, the most psychological distress would be right before they die of their disease. I, I certainly thought that. But actually, if you look at studies uh, in a continuum from when the patient was told they have lung cancer to if they pass away, the most stressful time is when they've been told they might have cancer and they receive their first treatment. This is incredibly stressful. There's a ton of uncertainty. Am I going to live? Am I not going to live? And so Getting them prepared is important. And of course, they want to be treated yesterday, despite the fact that a lung cancer might have been there for a number of years, starts at one cell and then has to divide, divide, divide. They want to treat, start treatment yesterday. I often say to my patients, it is more important for us to get this right than get it quick. Um, and, and I tell them, look, we're going to try to be bold, right? But to get you maybe a drug that would be the whole run ball for you, we might have to wait a little longer to be certain that we're getting the right uh, treatment for your disease, for your stage, um, irrespective of, by the way, whether it's a biomarker-directed therapy or not. So uh, the next, like we've already said in the original statement kind of goal here is to get the right biopsy. Make sure there's enough tissue for diagnosis, staging information, and biomarker testing. Yeah, and again, here, uh, things, for example, uh, we've covered in other webinars like uh, bone biopsies, even though it might stage the patient as metastatic, you have to decalcify them, and, and it's often difficult to run next-generation sequencing or do mutational testing on a bone biopsy. So if you give them the choice, for example, if you have advanced lung cancer on the mediastinum as well as positive bony mets, it, it's probably better to go to the mediastinum and get enough tissue for biomarker testing. Those are the kind of considerations we'd like to see. And I think, look, like... We're pulmonologists. We like to do bronchoscopy, but if it's a better, if there's a, a two centimeter lesion right underneath the rib cage, right next to the chest wall, it might be a better, uh, you know, use of time for that patient to have a transthoracic needle biopsy rather than uh, an another test. So we want to get the patient the right uh, a biopsy, whether we do it or our colleagues in thoracic surgery or interventional radiology do it. Uh, you want to make sure whoever's performing that biopsy knows that testing is going to be needed or likely be needed and what those tissue requirements are. So that's that's very similar to our institutional, make sure everyone's on the same page kind of. Yeah. So, you know, again, for our IR folks, we want them to get a good number of core tissue biopsies so that they know, like, this is a patient with no or suspected lung cancer that we need enough tissue for biomarker testing. Our IR folks are great 
Um, but if they don't know that's what they need to do, they might just do one or two cytologic biopsies, have Rose say, oh, yes, this is cancer, and then they just move on to the next patient. We can't have that. We need to make sure they know that we need core biopsies from what they do and plenty of tissue. So then this is kind of like the second half of this checklist, and these occur after uh, kind of a diagnosis is made. And and this arguably before or after, but you, you want to make sure there's an order plan established for uh, getting biomarker testing performed in a timely manner to prevent any delays. Yeah, and we certainly believe that that order should go in at the time of diagnosis. We don't think it's a good idea to wait till pathology runs through all their information, it gets back in the chart, goes to the oncologist, oncologist has a visit and then orders the biomarker testing. We believe that at the time of diagnosis. And in fact, we actually believe it's our responsibility as opposed to anyone else's to get that testing order. Uh, the next two bullets are about communication. We want to make sure that there's a plan for the biopsy results and the biomarker testing to get communicated to the patient and the oncology team uh, in, a, in a really reliable way. Uh, we should be considering repeat biopsy or uh, serum-based testing when ca in cases where there's not enough tissue uh, uh, for biomarker testing. Yeah, we want to keep that rate low, well less than 10%. And um, I, I think here, Adam, I'm, I'm really, um, as much as I don't like to do repeat biopsies, if it's going to make a huge difference for the patient, if they have a non-squamous, if they have some of the phenotypes that we consider really high likelihood, for example, um, a light smoking or never smoking Asian American um, female, we we might say, no, 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 like, let's go ahead and repeat this biopsy. Um, you know, and look, there are some times where the tumor is so poorly differentiated, you can't even tell whether it's squamous or adenocarcinoma, and the DNA is just destroyed, and it might be impossible to, to be able to do biomarker testing. I get that. That should be the vast minority of patients. And for most patients, we ought to be able to get enough to do that. And then you want to make sure there's a clear uh, plan in place for establishing the rest of any staging information that may be missing. Um, PET scans, MRI brains, any other suspicious sites that need to be excluded or included as metastatic sites, all of these things need to be handed off between uh, the team uh, to, to make sure that every, all this information is there because stage and biomarker testing along with that, uh, you know, diagnostic histology all comes together at once to really, what is the best first line treatment? Yeah. I mean, as much as we're emphasizing today, biomarker testing, right? Like the rest of the staging doesn't go away. Again, if they're seeing their oncologist two weeks later, only to find out, oh, they didn't get the MR of the brain to make sure there were no brain metastasis in a patient with metastatic or advanced lung cancer. That it's another delay that's been added in. And we, we, we again, we want to limit those delays. I feel like the pulmonary community does a really good job of, I hope, of, of diagnosing and staging um, so that they do know that, you know, for patients with advanced disease, we want to get a PET, uh, we want to get an MRI of the brain, and we want to make sure that we've documented um, uh, mediastinal disease in the chest. Uh, so, so those things I think we're good at, um, where we're hoping then to extend our skill set as pulmonologists is into the um, advanced uh, biomarker mutational testing. So I've got uh, two cases. The first is a pretty uh, a straightforward case, but um, they highlight different uh, aspects to these checklists and into this, into this kind of precision medicine theme. Uh, so the first case is a seven-year-old woman, no smoking history, presenting with cough, found to have a lung mass, and then also some suspected thoracic spinal mets. And um, they were brought to tumor board. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, for, uh, first, uh, we, we did, uh, this was a patient of mine, and I did tell them, hey, look, I, I think we need to get a biopsy here. And uh, look, this is going to take time. I was preparing them for after whatever biopsy is done, we're going to have to wait for those uh, biomarker tests to be completed. Yeah, so uh, Adam, I, you know, poor Adam sat next to me in clinic now uh, as a fellow and as an attending. Um, I, I usually talk to my patients in plain English, and I say to them, look, this is a three-step process, right? And I put it in plain English. What is it? That's the diagnosis. Where is it? That's the stage. What can we do about it? Those are the treatment options. Some of that can get done simultaneously, diagnosis and stage, but we cannot give you your treatment options until we have all this information back. 
So we're going to help you work through what is it, where is it, what can we do about it? Um, and again, I, I urge them to be patient so that I can get them the right treatment the first time around. So, so we did take this patient to Children Ward, I did, to really discuss what these spinal lesions were, to see if they were amenable to biopsy or not. Uh, a purely bony metastasis to the bone might require a lot of decalcification that degrades that DNA we need for a lot of our biomarker testing. Uh, but also, uh, if it's very soft tumor and kind of fleshy, maybe it's got plenty of good non, non-calcified tissue. Uh, so we reviewed that case, and, and the overall recommendation for virtual ward was let's just complete staging scans because we think this is metastatic cancer in an expedited fashion to really select the best, lowest risk site for biopsy for this patient. So this is uh, images from the PET scan. You can see the right lower lobe mass was pet avid. This level seven subcrinal lymph node actually wasn't actually noted to be abnormal on the non-contrasted CT chest. Uh, so this was an abnormal finding found there. These are the thoracic lesions that are largely bony uh, seen on the PET. And then the MRI brain did uh, have a, a couple. This is just one uh, enhancing lesion suspicious for metastatic spread. And so um, with this with this data in hand, uh, you know, we all agree this is kind of overwhelming evidence of metastatic lung cancer as long as the biopsy was supportive of that. And so uh, this patient got a bronchoscopy with EBUS uh, of that subcoronal lymph node uh, for diagnosis and at least some staging purposes. So proving N2 disease uh, better than biopsying the lung mass itself, which wouldn't prove, uh, prove any nodal or metastatic spread and more likely to provide biomarker testing than the bone. Uh, and with a better safety profile than biopsy of the brain. Yeah, so so um, the guidelines, which um, I was lucky enough to write in 2013, actually asked exactly for this. So we said, in every chance you could get, you should biopsy, and if this is a board question for the young uh, people or people uh, redoing their boards, you should biopsy the most advanced site for metastatic disease, unless unless you have overwhelming evidence of uh, metastatic disease by imaging. And in this case, it's clear that the, the spine uh, and uh, the brain both have lesions. Now, I can tell you if there was only one lesion, one tiny lesion in the brain or one lesion, particularly in the lower spine where it could be osteoarthritis and, and we see often in elderly patients with inflammation, no, that's not good enough. You have to try to exclude those so you make sure that you're not uh, you're not taking your patient out of maybe treatment for stage three disease or even surgical uh, uh, treatments. But this case is different, right? You don't want to do the brain biopsy. You definitely don't want to do a spine biopsy, particularly because you can't get enough tissue decalcified. Um, so for me, this is absolutely a case for EBUS. Now, had Adam showed us a uh, uh, the liver and the liver had large uh, uh, lesions that were pet avid. That's a safe biopsy. It would diagnose and stage at the same time and would give us enough tissue for mutational analysis. But that wasn't the case here. So I'm very, I'm very pleased that you went ahead with uh, EBUS. And and can you tell our audience how many passes you made of that subcrinal lymph node? So uh, this patient, I think, had about four or five actually for for just making sure we had a uh, good on site uh, on a slide. Uh, we did have a uh, rapid on-site evaluation with pathology there. And then uh, this patient had about seven passes to cell blocks since it took us a couple more to get good cellular evidence of, of malignancy on that on that first pass. As we, we did about seven uh, to cell block, dedicated to cell block for biomarker testing. Yeah, so and that might seem like a lot for folks out there. Just want to remind you that in the past, the literature suggested that after three to four, um, EBUS passes, the the level of uh, uh, yield didn't raise much. So if you did three or four passes, but that was for diagnosis. That was just, is it cancer or is it not? So yes, if you just are worried about cancer, making a diagnosis, three to four passes, you're fine. The problem is that you might not have enough tissue there to send off for biomarker testing. So I would urge people, um, if you don't have uh, on-site cytopathology, six or seven passes, as long as the patient's quiet, it's such a safe procedure. Please get more and more and more tissue. So uh, just a brief conclusion to this case, we had the EBUS adenocarcinoma was, con uh, was confirmed on cytology. 
Uh, we discussed those results and got them with oncology. Uh, and the patient did have an exon 20 uh, insertion in EGFR, uh, for which they met oncology shortly after. And so this is a pretty straightforward case. And for our check lock, checklist boxes, um, I was there and present for a lot of this. So I can tell you that I talked to the patient, uh, that we presented the patient at tumor board, uh, that we, we got these kind of sites that were going to be kind of this perfect balance or, or best balance, optimal balance of diagnosis stage, biomarker testing at risk of biopsy. Um, I knew of our local requirements at the time. Uh, next slide for the second half of the checklist here. Um, and, and that we we arranged and coordinated all of this stuff because we've been we've been working on coordinating this stuff uh, with, within our multidisciplinary team already. Um, next slide, we have a little bit of a more complicated case. Though. Just let me finish up on this by saying, look, like there's a second generation EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor, osimertinib. And I have had patients just like that, what Adam presented to you, that are now three years out three years out with an oral medication for metast wildly metastatic lung cancer, um, taking a pill, going to work every day, doing their jobs. If we had not done biomarker testing, this patient would have had traditional um, doublet chemotherapy with brain radiation, maybe some spine radiation if they had painful disease. And honestly, if they lived a year, we would have been jumping for joy. Now we have patients who were three years or more out on a second generation TKI. And you can take it. If it's out, they can receive another drug. I mean, there's there the the drugs for these uh, uh targeted therapies are showing clear evidence of uh very much longer term survival. So, you know, that case was good in that, you know, patient was unlucky to have metastatic lung cancer, but lucky to have a mutation for which they can receive oral medication. And, and just just to that final point, even if they had no actual mutation, which would have been really un, unfortunate, at least it wasn't unknown. You at least knew that you did a job of looking at actual mutations and that even if chemotherapy was their only option, you really knew it was their only option. Um, so, you know, that was a, a relatively straightforward case uh, in some regards of just, hey, look, this patient looks like they've got metastatic cancer. This is a little bit of a more complicated case. I don't want to spend forever on it, but I think it illustrates that this series of, of checklists and goals really work for even really strange and complicated cases. So this is, uh, you can see a, a, a left lower lobe mass uh, with someone uh, 65 presenting with weight loss fatigue. And again, you know, no, no history of tobacco use, which does increase uh, the likelihood of actual limitation, but doesn't guarantee it by any means. Um, I have the times kind of to the side of each of these things. So day zero is the date they got the scan, blood level of mass. They underwent in just three days. This wasn't my personal case, but in just three days, I went, underwent a bronchoscopy with EBIS of, uh, of, and mediocidal staging. They had an 11L that was abnormal, and they uh, uh, did biopsies of, of 11L as well as uh, multiple biopsies of the, the mass itself. Um, Pat uh, did show adenocarcinoma, so just uh, four days afterwards, adenocarcinoma, both of 11L and the mass. Uh, they were presented to a ward at nine days from presentation. They recommended staging scans and planned for neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy, uh, uh, presumably before surgery, and biomarker testing. Uh, the PET and an MRI brain were done in pretty short fashion. You know, about a week later, they had both of these done. It showed a slightly larger mass at about a little over five centimeters and no evidence of metastatic spread. Uh, so this was clinical stage 3A. Uh, biomarker testing, specimen was received by the outside commercial lab at 23 days. So this was a, a bit a bit of a jump and we'll count that as our order date. Uh, and then biomarker test results at day 30. They did have a PDL one score of 50%. And then other testing were negative, but much lower than the report. It, the, the full next generation sequencing wasn't performed only immunohistochemical stage, which would be a suboptimal test for, for targetable mutations. Um, neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy was started three cycles of that uh, at day 42. Repeat PET shows decreased size and activity, but still certainly present. They proceeded with a left lower lobe lobectomy and metastinal lymphadenectomy. Uh, lymphadenectomy. 
Uh, and unfortunately, a small plural nodule was actually excised. Frozen was negative, but was confirmed to be positive on, on final path. Uh, so you, you restarted the clock here because there'll be a new biomarker testing. So you see surgery is now day zero and uh, final sign out of pathology was 12 days later because it was a larger specimen. So now we're at uh, pathologic stage 4A. Uh, repeat biomarker testing from, from, from time of surgery was 14 days later. And they detected an EGFR exon 19 insertion deletion, which is uh, only prevalent in about 1% uh, percent of non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and they were started on osimertinib on day 53 from surgery. Uh, and six-month interval scans uh, after, after starting have still shown no evidence of disease. Uh, so, so to look at this timeline for this case, for this first biomarker test when they thought that the patient was um, uh, was early stage disease, you can see they did a, a really quick job to get a biopsy and to get a pathology result. Took them 16 days to get the order placed though. Uh, and the biomarker test result at seven days would be really quick, but remember they didn't do uh, anything with an immunohistochemical chemical stains and those stains are usually quick to turn around. Um, time to overall treatment was 15 days, which again is, is still pretty quick. But but with some lacking evidence there, test two was the surgical specialist. Time, time out though. So so I just want everyone to sort of look at adding up those numbers. I wish that, that I, I, we had put in a column there. But three plus four is seven. Seven and sixteen is twenty three. Another seven is thirty, and then that's forty five days. So from the first time that the CT scan was done to the first time of treatment was forty five days. It's actually. Not bad, but we often think about this as pulmonologists in our world, right? Like, oh yeah, I got it in quick. I did the bronchoscopy. Understanding that all of those days count from when the patient's first told they might have cancer and that 45 day period. And I promise you that was actually short. I think that that's short. I think you're looking for most patients at 60 days, two months, right? If you look in the middle here and you see that 16 days in the middle, that actually could have been that 16 days could have been peeled off if the biomarker testing was ordered at that day four time to pathology result if it was ordered there some of that 16 days could have been peeled away or if it was ordered at the time of biopsy it could have been peeled away so we think that that is a, a really really sort of um you know uh, difficult uh and unnecessary delay Take it away, Aaron. And I think for test two, if you look at the time to biomarker order, I think that's the uh, a surgeon who just found metastatic disease and did not want to. Uh, so I think there was a lot of uh, probably urgency from a surgery perspective to, to really get that in quickly, which is which is great. But it'd be great if this was standardized to be one to two days, uh, or the day of pathology sign out would be even better. Um, yeah. So look, I mean, the difference between sixteen days and two days, right? Like. And then the other question you have to ask yourself is why is the biomarker test result back in seven days in one circumstance, same patient, and 14 days in another? So these are the things that you can figure out if you work with your pathologist in your lab to find out, you know, like, like you listen, you know, the, the, what I've said to pathologists and other things, like, this is your grandmother, you really want her to wait two more extra weeks because we didn't order the test at the time that the biopsy was done? I think the answer is overwhelmingly no. So I, I do think understanding this is really important and, and taking it out just of the context of, oh, yes, we do biopsies and staging and put it into the context of what the patient, uh, the patient timeline is, what their trajectory is, is really important. So going to the checklist of this patient, you know, they did have a multidisciplinary approach uh, from what we can tell reviewing this case. They certainly did. They presented it to our board and we're discussing uh, with the surgeon uh, uh, plans for for neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy. Um, we don't know if the patient was informed uh, of biomarker testing and whether this delay was a, of any consequence to them. Um, it seemed like this, for what data they had, selected the, uh, the best biopsy sites uh, to give diagnosis stage and biomarker testing. Um, we don't know if the physician was aware of how much tissue was needed. Certainly, there was inadequate tissue for the for the tests they attempted to perform on the bronchoscopy. Uh, and after diagnosis, you know, there was a delay uh, uh, for ordering biomarkers. So we don't know if there was really a coordinated plan or not. It was certainly recommended by the tumor board, but it wasn't done 
uh, you know, uh, efficiently as it could have been. Um, there was a communication plan to the treatment teams, it seems, because that was a, a fairly expeditious kind of on review. Um, and, uh, you know, they had, I think, missed the, the, the case didn't have uh, enough uh, tissue for that first test. So I think that they, they didn't think about a repeat biopsy because they didn't know it was there. Um, and then they they had a clear clear timeline and had very quick uh, time to biopsy and, and get in obtaining their stage information for sure. So so overall conclusions, uh, everyone has to get together. Uh, all stakeholders uh, across cancer care have to get together to really make a reliable, agreed upon plan. Uh, if you're setting up biomarker testing for lung cancer, to really make it effective and efficient. Um, and then secondly, we have to get that team together frequently because th this is changing on on a yearly basis as to what needs to be tested and at whom. And then uh, finally, a, a myriad of, of, of presentations accompany all of these patients. Everyone's got different comorbid conditions and, and interesting uh, imaging findings that have to be evaluated. Uh, but, but the goal remains the same, which is timely biomarker informed treatment uh, for everyone who's eligible. So I just want to uh, tell you that what's so incredible is the support that Chess um, and our partners, AstraZeneca, Sanofi, and, and Pfizer, have put together two hundred thousand dollar grants. Um, and you know, like, look, I've been a, a member of Chess for over thirty three years, maybe thirty five years now, and um, we have been always at the front end of taking care of folks with lung cancer through our guidelines, through our educational offerings through things like this webinar. Uh, one thing that we really have wanted to do and have not always had the funding for is to, to develop research applications and grants. So this is a request for proposals. $200,000 grants are open for applications. Um, and, and through these grants, CHESS seeks to evaluate the impact of biomarker chess list, uh, checklist in achieving the following goals, increased proportion of specimens processed properly after biopsy, increase the number of patients tested for biomarker mutations, increase the proportion of patients for whom biomarker enabled targeted therapy, and increase the care coordination among the various disciplines involved in lung cancer. So if you'd like to, and there's a QR code there that you could take a picture of, and we'll, we're going to be advertising this in multiple different venues. Um, we would love to see those proposals and see what you propose to uh, to do a, a quality improvement endeavor to to increase your testing to see what uh, see what interesting and innovative things um, are available to you as uh, as researchers and as those who want to implement biomarker testing in your institution uh, doesn't necessarily have to be um, an academic medical center it could be a community site that's really interested in getting this right. Um, and so we welcome uh, those uh, grant applications. Uh, we're going to stop there and leave this on the board and open it up to questions. And Adam is the keeper of the questions. So Adam, go ahead. Well, uh, the first question was talking about the timeline for the first case. And unfortunately, I don't have that timeline readily available. Um, that patient was... Uh, seen on a Tuesday and presented at multidisciplinary thoracic tour board the next day on Wednesday. Uh, and if, I, if my memory serves me, that um, that those staging scans were done within a week. Uh, it, we have a nurse navigator who, when, when things are, are really, uh, when time is really of the essence, really calls and coordinates these scans. And they were probably done within a week or a week and a half. Um, and we, we um, I think, I think if I remember correctly too, had I actually ordered an interventional uh, CT guided biopsy, and as soon as we got those path results back, I mean those imaging results back, we converted uh, to to a bronchoscopy because we could do it quickly, uh, and it was kind of the more favorable test. So unfortunately, I didn't have the time to break down uh, all of the timelines for that first case like I did the second case. Um, and 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 some of Adam's career development awards, we are looking at large data sets to see if we can sort out um, just how much this happens and when it happens in both our institution, but in many other institutions across the United States. While we're doing this, you're going to see a biomarker testing assessment come up on your screen. We'd ask you just to go ahead and click those buttons while the questions come up. Adam, go on to the next question. 
I think we're still waiting for a few questions to come in, but I think while we while we're on that topic of time to treatment, I think that like like uh, like you said earlier in the talk that that thirty days even from time of suspicion to starting a therapy is maybe even uh, uh, rarely uh, achieved with all of the different times of setting up biopsy, getting results, ordering the results, and getting them back, and then getting it all put together. I think we're easily, like you said, I think a short time frame might be more like 40 or 50 days. Yeah, so, and and uh, I published this study with a woman named Katie of Melheim and some groups from the ASCO uh, where they looked at what what that delay meant and um, uh, particularly some of the younger oncologists around the United States actually started chemotherapy if they thought that the testing was going to take longer than two weeks. So they would be starting perhaps drugs that could make patients sick and 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 then we and not be able to restart the medication once their biomarker testing came back. And so, again, I think it's imperative to get that testing done um, right out of the gate so that the patient gets the right therapy the first time. Have any other questions come in, Adam? Our next question was about hospital inpatients newly diagnosed with lung cancer, uh, perhaps incidentally, either on a nodule uh, and who may be uninsured. Yeah, um, you want to take the first part? I'll take the uninsured yeah, yeah. part if you take the hospital part and tell them what that means, yeah. So so uh, there are, there is implications for extra barriers, for, for especially for biomarker testing uh, for, for patients who are inpatient. Uh, the way Medicare, especially if Medicare is kind of the paradigm for most of these patients in terms of insurance, Medicare reimburses outpatient procedures and inpatient procedures differently. Outpatient procedures is fee for surface. So if you do a test, you get reimbursed for the test. And inpatient, it's all lumped together under a diagnosis code. And so unfortunately, uh, the people who are looking at reimbursement for various tests will see an inpatient, an outpatient, that money comes in for that test, or at least it costs no money to the hospital because if a commercial lab does it, they bill uh, directly uh, uh, to Medicare or to insurance for that. But for inpatients, when it's run inpatient, that looks to be an extra charge to people and that that, disrupt, that disrupts care in some ways. And so um, it's just like a sick uh, patient in the ICU, uh, extra days and extra care will, will cost money. You only get reimbursed uh, for, for these diagnosis related codes for who's admitted. Um, and so I think we argue that this is a rare instance and that uh, we should try to avoid any delay in ordering biomarker testing if it's if it's really uh, as time sensitive as it often can be in the metastatic stage. If it truly is just a lung nodule, uh, an early stage uh, stage cancer, well, maybe we couldn't wait those two weeks for which Medicare would would bill it separately uh, to allow uh, other work to be done. Certainly, the patient still needs st probably staging scans. Or maybe even invasive mediastinal staging with with bronchoscopy, um, but I, I we would probably argue to advocate for those inpatients who are really ha you know they're inpatient perhaps because of their cancer because of pneumonia or or um, or compression of great structures that really biomarker testing can't wait. And and I want to add a piece about the insurance. So uh, when when you're negotiating again once you put together your little uh uh your team your operations team to look into this if you're ordering this outside of your institution um uh if you order sending it out to for example foundation uh, uh one or or some of the other garden or the other biomarker testing groups um they do have patient support uh areas for those that are uninsured so if the patient doesn't have money um, they will, uh, particularly, and I, I, I get them to agree to that. Look, we're going to be sending you all our other cases. Um, we may have patients at the, every now and again who will have no health care insurance. Um, you know, uh, this testing is expensive. Will you will you test those patients for us with that free of charge? And and the, and the agreement we've had uh, when we send our things out is that absolutely they will. Well, I guess then, and we are up right around the time. We have uh, a few minutes left. We'll give you a few minutes back in your day. Um, uh, Adam, I really want to thank you both for um, uh, helping with this webinar, but also um, for, for really dedicating the early part of your career to helping solve this problem for our patients. I want to thank our audience who's 
um, always uh, great and and um, uh, I think uh, hopefully got something out of this. I know some of this was pretty dry, um, uh, but but I hope that you you took away something from this. I also really want to thank um, AstraZeneca, Sanofi, and Pfizer for supporting this grant and also supporting this webinar. And of course, as always, thanking the chess staff uh, who help us uh, keep on time, uh, get the webinar set up. And so thank you guys as well. Um, I guess this will uh, end our uh, webinar and uh, we appreciate uh, y'all being here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.